everyone and welcome to a brand new edition of the S Factor. I'm your host Chuck Shazer. I want to welcome you aboard my starship as we talk about all things science. So step right aboard and take a look around you. We're going to travel around the solar system, go into deep space, talk about all things terrestrial and celestial right here on the S Factor. Again, thank you for joining me on this great radio station, Cruise 92.1 WVLT. And if you're listening to the podcast of the S Factor on Google Podcast or Apple Podcast, or if you're at scienceanimated.net listening to the S Factor podcast there, thank you for listening. Leave me a star rating, a review. I'd love that. If you're listening to me on facebook.com slash scienceanimated, welcome. Twitter.com slash scienceanimated, Welcome aboard. I want to wish everyone a happy new year. Here we are, January 2nd, 2021. So many people have waited so long for the year 2021. We're all hoping it's a better year. We're hoping that we get pandemic free. That would be a great thing. I just want to wish everyone a happy new year. Let's get right down into the science news. And then our featured topic today is going to be, remember the Jetsons? Meet George Jetson. We're going to talk about floating cities. That's right. How futuristic does that sound? We're going to talk about floating cities right here on the S Factor. Again, welcome aboard. I'm your host, Chuck Shazer. You can check me out here the first Saturday of the month, every month, right here on Cruise 92.1 WVLT, and also at scienceanimated.net. Let's get right down into the science news. Facial hair is biologically useless. So why do humans have it? Now, this story is brought to you by Wired.com. Let's see what's going on with facial hair. Why the heck do we have it? Do you ever think about that? You know, if you're a guy and you have a beard, there's a lot of fellas out there that have long beards today. Long beards, like ZZ Top. You know, when you have a beard that long, that has its own maintenance. That's like a head of hair. As far as, you know, you got to scrub it, you got to wash it. But some people have these long, luscious beards. And when you think about the history of human facial hair... When you're talking about science, you're talking about evolution, why in the heck do we have it? There are really two, there are really only two types of facial hair, beards and mustaches. Every style of facial hair that you've ever seen is one of these two or a combination of both. Think about it like part of a linean taxonomy of human traits that we just made up, where facial hair is a family, beards and mustaches are a genus, and their many varieties are individual species that could interbreed, as it were to create hybrid subspecies like the duck-billed platypus of the facial hair family, the soul patch. (laughs) I think the soul patches are pretty cool. I've never had one. Then why would you be thinking about this at all unless you work in the relatively booming beard care industry where you're a lover of beards and the bearded? In February 2014, the New York Post ran a story about men in Brooklyn paying as much as $8,500 for facial hair transplants in order to grow better beards. Doesn't that make you feel good out there, guys, if you or just have been blessed with thick, luscious facial hair? There's some people that I know that have trouble growing beards. A lot of trouble. And they're quite honestly jealous when they see a nice beard or they see my beard. Sometimes I've had a beard, sometimes I've had a goatee. I've, I, I love having a beard, but like, listen, some people have beard envy. Now, if you are breathing right now, then you must be aware that the beards The Economist reported on, facial hair grew more popular over the rest of the decade until it became a full-blown phenomenon of 21st century maleness. It even had a cameo in the beginning of the novel coronavirus pandemic. Media outlets stumbled on a 2017 infographic from the Center's for disease control showing which facial hair uh, styles were okay with a standard respirator or N95 mask and which styles were less ideal because they crossed the seal, allowing all manner of nasty little things access to your wide open mouth. 14 mustaches, 12 beards, 9 beard mustache hybrids, and a clean shaven option. There's a chart here that revealed something that we hadn't thought of before. Facial hair doesn't seem particularly functional. And if that's true, then the question is, why do we have facial hair at all? Well, scientists aren't exactly sure, but they have come up with the best evolutionary guess that makes a lot of sense. If you take a step back to see the forest through the trees, or the beard for the whiskers, as it were. As it turns out, facial hair is not a functional physical human trait. 
in the way that we thought it was for many years. It is an ornamental one. In fact, all of the physical features on the human body, including other kinds of hair, facial hair is the only one that is purely or primarily ornamental. Now think about that. Usually, there's a reason we are a specific way. There's a reason our bodies function a certain way. There's a reason that we look a certain way. We can attribute that to evolution. But in this case, they're saying that facial hair is purely ornamental. Meaning it's, honestly, superficial in the evolutionary way of looking at it. Now here, now we'll just take a look at what the, the rest of the hair on our bodies does for us. Because the rest of the hair that we have on our bodies actually has a purpose. Now body hair... Now I'm thinking about Georgia Animal Steel here. <laughs> Remember Georgia Animal Steel? He was very hairy. <laughs> now, body hair helps with thermoregulation. Head hair protects your scalp from the beating sun, but also traps heat in if you're in a cold weather climate. Eyelashes are like screen doors for the eyes, keeping bugs and dust and little debris particles out whenever they're open. Eyebrows impede sweat from getting in your eyes. Armpit hair. Armpit hair can be quite nasty. Have you ever seen someone wear a tank top and you can see the armpit hair emanating from under their arms? Pretty attractive, right? <laughs> armpit hair, technically called auxiliary hair, collects and disseminates pheromones while acting like the WD-40 of body hair, reducing friction between skin on the underside of the arm and skin on the side of the chest as we walk and swing our arms. Pubic hair also helps reduce friction as well as provides a layer of protection from bacteria and other pathogens. But facial hair? You'll notice it doesn't appear on that handy list of adaptive hairy traits. In the early days of studying this kind of stuff, evolutionary biologists thought it might serve thermoregulatory or prophylactic purposes similar to body hair and pubic hair. Beards and mustaches around the mouth after all, and the mouth takes in food and other particles that might carry disease. Beards and mustaches are also on the face, which is connected to the head, which loses a lot of heat out of its top if it isn't covered by hair. It all makes sense when you look at it that way. Except there's a problem with this theory. It leaves out 50% of the population. Females. Natural selection is ruthless. And it has sent a lot of species the way of the dodo. But rarely, if ever, does it select for a trait in a species like that and leave half the population hanging. Especially the half that makes all the babies the most important half. If facial hair were meant to perform important functions, it would be present across both sexes. Instead, thick, mature facial hair is present almost exclusively on the male half of the species. And its only job is to sit there on the face of the wearer as a signal to everyone who crosses his path. Now what signal does facial hair send, you may ask? Well, here's where it gets a little complicated. As ornamental traits go, University of New Mexico professor Jeffrey Miller, one of the preeminent evolutionary psychologists in the field, put it this way. The two main explanations for male facial hair are intersexual attraction, which is attracting females, and intrasexual competition, intimidating rival males. So what he's basically saying is it's I want to show how manly I am and I want to attract I want to attract the op the opposite sex. Basically facial hair signals one thing to potential partners, namely virility and sexual maturity, the hubba bubba type stuff. And something else to potential rivals, formidably and wisdom or godliness. Taken together, these signals confer their own brand of elevated status to the men with the most majestic mustaches or the biggest, burliest beards. So it's a manly thing, is what this professor is saying, Professor Jeffrey Miller. The signal that facial hair sends also sends, tends to be stronger and more reliable between males who are more commonly rivals than it is between males and females who are more commonly partners. In fact, evolutionary biologists will tell you that while some females really like facial hair, and some don't, and some couldn't care less, more often than not, attraction has as much to do with beard density as anything else. That is, if you're in a place where there are a lot of beards, 
say a lumberjack convention. <laughs> Can you imagine such a thing? A lumberjack convention. How a lumberjack convention. I would imagine you see a lot of flannel there as well. <laughs> then a clean shaven face at a convention like that is more appealing. But if you're surrounded by bare faces, then a beard is best. I bet you never knew there was so much about beard psychology. In, evol in evolutionary genetics, this is called negative frequency dependence, NFD, which is science speak for the idea that when a trait is rare within a population, it tends to have an advantage. In guppies, for example, males with a unique combination of colored spots mate more often and are preyed upon less. This is a huge, comp this is a huge competitive advantage. It's like going to Vegas expecting to lose $1,000 but hoping to break even only to end up winning 1000 instead. That's a $2,000 swing. It's the same thing for a trait with NFD selection. The trait goes from fighting for its life to being the life of the party. The downside is that the competitive advantage can result in overpopulation of others with the same trait very quickly. Not to worry, nature has a solution for that. As more guppies bear that same trait, it leads to a decrease in interest from mates and an increase in attention from predators. What was once the hot new guppy thing becomes old news, in other words. This yo-yo back and forth between common and non-common doesn't just explain the variability and the attractiveness of facial hair from population to population. It also explains why the dominant theory for the evolution of facial hair has begun to result, revolve around intersexual competition. Because it's not enough simply to be attractive. You have to be more attractive than the people around you and in, in enough of the right ways to stand out. This goes a long way toward understanding the ebb and flow and the popularity of facial hair across time. Sporting a killer stash or a bushy beard is only effective evolutionarily as long as it still makes you part of the hot new guppy thing around the pond. When it makes you old new, shaving becomes the more effective choice. Now I've noticed that myself in, in real life, just walking around or you know, watching television, watching movies, you see more people with beards. Beards have definitely become the hot thing. You see very young people, the minute they can grow a beard, it is like ZZ Top. Throughout history, people have donned facial hair or shaved it as a response to the choices of their enemies and rivals. The ancient Romans went clean-shaven for 400 years because the ancient Greeks, their rivals during the Hellenistic period, celebrated beards as symbols of elevated status and high-mindedness. For the 270 years the English lived under threat of Viking invasion, a period from 793 to 1066 AD, tellingly called the Viking Age of Invasion, Englishmen went clean-shaven as a cultural reaction to their bearded Viking invaders. During the Protestant Reformation, many Protestants grew out their beards in protest against Catholicism, whose priests were typically clean-shaven. What's even more fascinating is how great an impact rulers and other high-status individuals have had on facial hair trends. In the Middle Ages, Henry V was the first king of England to go clean-shaven, and because he was such a great monarch, English society and the subsequent seven kings followed in his beardless footsteps. It wasn't until Henry VIII came along, in all his egotistical, murderous glory, that the beard made a comeback, undoubtedly as a way for him to distinguish himself from his predecessors. So what will happen to facial hair when a health crisis meets a political and economic crisis? Your guess is as good as ours, but if and when that happens, you can be pretty sure it's going to look funny. So as far as science goes, what did we learn about this? Well, we learned that there's really no evolutionary reason to have facial hair. It is simply a choice. It has been a choice that people have made throughout human history. They've had them for different reasons. And in my Humble opinion, I think that what's happening right now with the beard craze, and this beard craze, I think, has been going on now for probably a good 10 years. One day, it won't be cool to have a beard, and I'll probably still have mine, but that was a really cool article from Wired. I want to take a quick time out and talk to one of the S-Factor's sponsors. I actually had her in the studio. That was pretty cool. Tawny Basil from Tawny Fit. It's a really busy time of the year for her. It's the beginning of a new year, a beginning of new resolutions, and usually health and fitness is a really hot topic in regards to that. So here's my conversation with Tawny Basil of Tawny Fit. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk to you about something that is near and dear to so many people's hearts this time of year. Of course, we are in a brand new year 
which is so wonderful for so many people. Everyone has been looking so forward to this new year. And what about not only looking forward to the new year, but what about looking forward to a new you? That's right. The number one sponsor of the S Factor is Tawny Fit. It is run, owned, and operated by a certified personal trainer named Tawny Basil. She's been doing it for a while, folks, and she can get you in the best shape of your life. And this is the best time of the year. There's so many people that make that New Year's resolution. How many people stick to it? Well, that's up to you, but Tony can get you set up on the right foot. And guess who I have in studio? I've been waiting for this for a long time. Tony Basil is here in studio. Tony, how you doing? Hey, how are you? Great, and I, I'm i sure this is a busy time of year for you. Definitely is. You have all the New Year's resolutions going around, right? The number yes. one has to be fitness, it has to be. Definitely is, yes, everybody on Facebook, on my Instagram, they're already posting New Year's resolution, get in shape. Yeah, there's so many people that flock to gyms. It's probably the busiest time for gyms also, I'd imagine, right? It usually is. I'm not sure about COVID now, um, because a lot of people are worried about going to gyms. Um, But, you know, great news is you don't need a gym to work out. That means Tawny can bring the fitness expertise to you directly. And how do you do that exactly? And now if they want to go to the gym, they can, right? Oh, absolutely. So we, I do gym, I do in home, I bring the equipment to you, and I also do virtual, which, you know, depending on your fitness level, you may not need any equipment whatsoever. Now, what about that, folks? That, mean if, that means if you're listening right now and you're thinking about this, and you're like, well, maybe I don't have weights. I'm not ready for this. It doesn't matter. Tawny Basil will train you. No weights required. What about that? There's, How can you say no? There's so many ways you can do this that, and let's, let's say you tried everything. Let's say that you are fed up with diet pills and maybe you've even tried some stuff online. Give Tawny a shot. She's been doing it for a while. She has a nice track record. She has a lot of results behind her to back it up and start the new year off right. Now, Tawny, if they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? So I'm Tawny Fit on all social media across all platforms and you can also email me at tawnyfit at gmail.com or text ready to 609-674-8077 now if somebody has a gym membership how would that work with you um if it is a privately owned gym then that will be no problem um i would have to talk to the owner and and get allowance in that Um, but as far as commercial gyms go it is a little bit harder really just depends on who owns the gym. Now, if somebody has a gym at home, can you still help them? If they bought some weights or an elliptical, we make house visits to help people or not? Absolutely, I do house visits. And also, if you kind of feel like you you can work out on your own, but you need a little bit of guidance, I can also write you a workout plan for you to do on your own as well. Well, you can't beat that, folks. I mean, no matter what your situation is, no matter how busy you may be, no matter if you want to go to a gym or not, in either case, Tawny Basil can help you reach your goal. Now, that's what it's all about. And we're not talking about starting this and ending it. We're talking about getting the steps, getting the tools that you need to carry on and achieve your goal, whether it's to lose weight, get stronger. You know, in any event, it's going to help you live a better life, a healthier life. And, you know, most importantly, be there for your family in the coming years. When you take care of yourself, you increase your odds of doing that. So, Tony, just one more time, tell the folks how they can get in touch with you if they are interested in utilizing your, your... And I think you had an offer, by the way, for the S-Factor folks, didn't you, with a free session if they mentioned the show? Absolutely. If we don't want to forget that. If you mention the show, you get a free session. Um, you can reach me at 609-674-8077. Text ready. That's right. Text ready, folks. When you're ready to you get in the best shape of your life, Tony Basil is here with Tony Fit. Thank you so much, Tony, for coming in today. Thank you for having me. Welcome back to the S Factor. I'm your host, Chuck Shazer. You can catch this show the first Saturday of every month at 1 o'clock right here on Cruising 92.1 WVLT. You can also listen to the podcast version of this radio show, scienceanimated.net. You'll see the S Factor uh, navigation tab there. Or you can look for me at Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. Just type in the S Factor and the show will pop right up there for you as well. YouTube, the YouTube channel, which you can get, the easiest way to get there is through scienceanimated.net. And if you have little ones in your life, scienceanimated.net is the home to Science Animated the Human Body, which is a 40-minute DVD and also a streaming movie that you can purchase the DVD on the website or you can purchase the stream for $9.99. 
And then there's free content there as well, scienceanimated.net. Of course, the S Factor is brought to you by scienceanimated.net. So check that out. I'd appreciate that very much. How many of you out there, and I'm, I'd be willing to say there's quite a few of you that have gotten a telemarketing call and you thought it was a real life human being. And what it actually is, is artificial intelligence. Ladies and gentlemen, AI is getting so close to sounding like a real person on the phone. I have to admit, about five years ago, I was tricked by that, and I'll never forget it. It was very bizarre. When I was speaking to this male voice on the other end of the phone, I assumed it was a human being only because of the nuanced stuff. Like, after he or I would say something, he'd say, all right, or something like that. Just kind of like the those little nuance items is exactly what can trick you and fool you into thinking it's a real life human being you have on the phone. I'm going to read you this next news bit is from Scientific American. Artificial intelligence is now shockingly good at sounding human. Synthetic voices have become ubiquitous. They feed us directions in the morning, shepherd us through phone calls by day, and broadcast the news on smart speakers at night. And as the technology used to make them improves, these voices are becoming more and more human sounding. This is the final frontier in synthetic speech, replicating not just what we say, but how we say it. And remember, that's what I was referring to when I got that phone call from that, what I thought was a human telemarketer years ago. Rupal Patel heads a research group at Northeastern University that studies speech prosody, the changes in pitch loudness and duration that we use to convey intent and emotion through voice. Sometimes people think of it as the icing on the cake. Patel says she grew interested in prosody after finding it was the only element of vocal communication that seemed to be available to people with some kinds of severe speech disorders. These patients were able to make expressive sounds even if they could not speak clearly. In 2014, Patel founded a company to build custom synthetic voices for non-speaking individuals. Synthetic speech has come a long way over the years. At age 9, Siri is the oldest virtual assistant, but in the world of speaking machines, she's a baby. People have been trying to synth synthesize speech since th at least the 18th century. When an Austro-Hungarian inventor built a crude replica of the human vocal track that could articulate entire phrases, albeit in monotone. Current machine learning techniques can model human speech, complete with awkward pauses and lip smacks. Still training on thousands of samples per second is prohibitively expensive for most real-world systems. Researchers, including those at Vocal ID, are continually implementing newer and more effective methods. I want to know if you've ever been tricked by one of these. So if you have, please reach out to me. I know this is a pre-recorded show, but reach out to me. Email me. My email address is info at scienceanimated.net. Info at scienceanimated.net. Tell me your story. I want to know. I'm curious. Have you ever come across anything like this where you thought that marketer is real? And obviously, maybe towards the end, something awkward happened and you realized, wow, that wasn't a person after all. I want to hear from you if you've encountered that. But even as the remaining gaps between human and synthetic speech are steadily closing, truly lifelike prosody continues to elude even the most sophisticated systems. Maybe that's still missing. Maybe what's still missing requires machines not only to mimic humans, but also to feel like us. Now it's brought to you by Scientific American. Again, voices, these voice commands, these voice prompts, whatever you want to call them, they're advancing so rapidly. Please contact me if you've come across anything like that. We're going to take a quick time out. You are listening to The S Factor. I'm your host, Chuck Shazer. We'll be back after this. Welcome back. Now we're going to talk about one of my loves, of course, is space, space travel, all the cool stuff that Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX and how he's building these reusable rockets that they plan on, you know, using these to take us to Mars and beyond. The U.S. and China are, are talking about, you know, individually are talking about manned moon missions. Elon Musk has talked about 
moon bases? I think, you know, if we avoid a calamity of any kind, whether it's terrestrial or celestial, over the next 10 years, I think we're going to make it. And think about how exciting that is. Especially after the year what we th- that we just had in 2020. Think how that would bring us together as a human race. Seeing someone walk on the moon, seeing someone on their way to Mars. That would be 24-hour news. Watching a crew travel to Mars and it be documented. That's going to be some great, great stuff to view on television, on the internet, however you consume most of your entertainment. So this from Neos News and World Report. World Space Achievements, a bright spot in stressful 2020. Astronauts blasted into orbit from the U.S. for the first time in nearly a decade. Three countries sent spacecraft hurling towards Mars, and robotic explorers grabbed rocks from the moon and gravel from an asteroid for a return to Earth. Space provided moments of hope and glory in an otherwise difficult, stressful year. It promises to do the same in 2021 with February's landing at Mars and next fall's planned launch of the Hubble Space Telescope's successor, the next generation James Webb Space Telescope. Boeing hopes to catch up with SpaceX and the astronaut launching department while space tourism may finally get off the ground. 2021 promises to be as much of a space exploration bright spot, perhaps even more, said Scott Hubbard, NASA's former Mars czar, now teaching at Stanford University. Although the coronavirus pandemic complicated space operations around the globe in 2020, most high-priority missions remained on track, led by the U.S., China, and United Arab in United Arab Emirates in a stampede to Mars in July. The UAE's first interplanetary spacecraft, an orbiter, will scrutinize the Martian, the Martian atmosphere. NASA's Perseverance rover is set to land February 18th at an ancient river delta and lake bed where microscopic life may have once flourished. The rover will drill into the dry dust crust collecting samples for eventual return to Earth. China's orbiter duo, Taiwan-1, Quest for Heavenly Truth, also will hunt for signs of bygone life. The European and Russian space agencies skipped the 2020 Mars launch window. Their life-sniffing Mars rover grounded until 2022 because of technical issues and COVID-19 restrictions. So you have the U.S., you have China... Russia, European, all getting into space more and more now. China also set its sights on the moon in 2020, landing and then launching off the lunar surface in December with the first moon rocks collected for return to Earth since the 1970s. Japan brought back pieces of asteroid Raigu, its second asteroid batch in a decade. More asteroid samples are on their way. NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft vacuumed up handfuls of gravel from asteroid Bennu in October for return in 2023. Elon Musk's SpaceX, meanwhile, was buzzing in 2020. In May, it became the first private company to put people into orbit, an achievement previously claimed by just three global superpowers. The two test pilots were the first NASA astronauts to fly a new brand of spaceship in almost 40 years and the first to blast off from Florida since the shuttle program ended in 2011. I remember when the shuttle program ended in 2011. Many people didn't know what was coming next. Is this the end of space exploration? It sounded and seemed crazy to assume such a thing, to believe such a thing. In November, four more astronauts rode a SpaceX Dragon capsule to the International Space Station. Three weeks later, SpaceX launched its biggest cargo shipment yet to the space station for NASA. This is an impressive achievement, which Americans should be proud of, astronaut-turned-Senator Mark Kelly said of the Dragon capsule doubleheader. Until the SpaceX flights, Russia's three-person Soyuz capsules were the only way to get astronauts to the space station once NASA's shuttles shut down. NASA's other hired crew transporter, Boeing, is scrambling to get its Starliner capsule back in action 
after a software spoiled test flight in December 2019. The do-over, again with no one on board, is targeted for spring. If the repairs work and a capsule finally reaches the space station, the first Starliner astronauts could be flying by summer. So there's so there is a plethora of things happening in the world of space. It's very exciting. So many countries involved in space exploration right now, private industry, namely SpaceX. It won't be long before there are actual private citizens. You won't have to be a trained astronaut, folks. You can be a private citizen, and if you have the right bank account, <laughs> if you have the right amount in your bank account, I should say, you will be taking visits into space. Private citizens. We're finally getting close to you know, what we all perceived growing up as this time period, what would be happening with space in the 2020s. Musk capped the year with a stratospheric test flight of Starship, the rocket ship he's building to carry people to the moon and Mars. The December 9th demo went better than anyone imagined until a fiery explosion at touchdown. Even so, Musk was ecstatic. Late last year, SpaceX expects to launch the first privately financed Dragon flight in a deal arranged by Houston-based Axiom Space. Axiom's Michael Lopez Alegria, an ex-NASA astronaut and former president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, will accompany Israeli businessman Inton Stibble and two other paying customers to the space station. Stibble, a formal flight, a former fighter pilot, was a close friend of Israel's first astronaut, Ayam Rahman, who died aboard Space Shuttle Columbia in 2003. Will Tom Cruise be joining them? The actor was in talks with NASA this year about filming a movie at the space station. This is a true beginning of private spaceflight, and will get the ball rolling towards multiple private missions to orbit per year. Lopez said in an email, I've been preaching for almost a decade that commercial human spaceflight is the next giant leap. And it will be. Two other space travel companies, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin and Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic, are still conducting test flights and have yet to set firm dates for launching customers on short flights to the edge of space and back. NASA is still targeting a November debut of its new moon rocket, the Space Launch System, with an Orion capsule that will launch without a crew. The Trump administration had sent a 2024 deadline for the first moon landing by astronauts since NASA's Apollo program a half century ago. Just this month, NASA introduced the 18 astronauts who will train for the moon program named for Artemis, the mythical twin sister of Apollo. It remains to be seen how President-elect Joe Biden might alter the lunar landing program. Whatever else can be said about the four years of the Trump administration, they have been positive for the U.S. civilian space program, noted John Lodgston, professor at George Washington University Space Policy Institute. No prior major programs were canceled. The human exploration program was given clear direction and funding for existing programs was increased. How exciting is all of this? Hopefully the new administration will not alter that too much. I think we're on a great roadmap as a country for space exploration. And there, there's just so much going on. It almost feels like in a way... A new space race, does it not? 1969, we beat Russia to the moon. A manned moon mission. Who will get to Mars first? I'm a big Star Trek fan, so I always feel like, you know, if countries all work together, it would probably be the coolest way to do it because the thing about it, everybody's resources together to accomplish these things, and not only space exploration, but also any kind of a threat like an asteroid, a solar flare, anything that be, may be coming our way, working on it together would be the absolute fastest way to solve any of these problems and achieve the most, I think. I mean, NASA was using Russia, Russia's rockets to get up to the International Space Station, for heaven's sakes. If you told someone in 1969 after the moon landing that after the year 2011, we'd be relying on Russian technology to get to the International Space Station, I think Americans would have said, you were absolutely crazy if you said that to them back then. 
So I'm glad we're away from all that and we're and, and we're kind of privatizing space and we're using private industry to achieve these things. Really super cool stuff. I'm going to take another quick time out. You're listening to The S Factor. I'm your host, Chuck Shazer. I hope you love science because I do. That's what The S Factor is all about. And you can catch me here the first Saturday of the month at 1 o'clock on Cruise 92.1 WVLT. And you can catch me 24-7 at scienceanimated.net. That's science animated.net. And if you miss any of these shows, there's 14 of them now. We've covered so many cool co- topics together. If you go to Google Podcast or Apple Podcasts, this show becomes a podcast after it airs on Cruise 92.1 WVLT. So if you type in the S factor, you'll see me there. We'll be right back. Now we all remember the Jetsons. Well, I, I'm sure some of you do at least the Jetsons, it was a futuristic animation. If you have never seen it, I'll give you a quick briefing on it. It was done by Hanna-Barbera. Very Flintstones-ish in its style. Of course, the cartoon or the the characters, the character design and also the animation being a limited animation, of course. It was a futuristic animation of a family and they lived in the clouds. So... The feature topic today is going to be on floating cities. Now, immediately, my mind goes to the Jetsons. It goes to Hanna-Barbera. Thinking about George Jetsons, uh, George Jetson, excuse me, in the clouds. This is something from Scientific American that I found very intriguing. Could floating cities be a haven as coastlines submerge? Now, we know for a undisputable fact. It's unequivocal. That with the melting of these large glaciers, and because of global warming, they are melting. Now, of course, you could sit back and you could debate all day long about if it's man-made or it's natural or if it's a little bit of both. But one thing that's unequivocal is that it is happening. It is melting in the Arctic, and it is raising sea levels. It has to. The water's going somewhere. It's going into the ocean. And so this will happen. Sea levels will rise. Coastlines will change. I don't think there's any stopping it at this point. But here we go. By century's end, tens of millions of U.S. coastal property owners will face a decision embodied in the popular exhortation. Move it or lose it. But there's an option for people who can't imagine a home without an ocean view. Let's face it, that is beautiful. It's called seasteading, and it could be a 21st century antidote to the nation's disappearing shorelines. Floating cities could become climate havens for people whose lives and livelihoods are tethered to the sea or nearby coast, according to the San Francisco-based Seasteading Institute. In many cases, floating colonies would be populated by people whose homes are rendered uninhabitable by raising seas and storm surges that chew away at the edge of the continent. Residents would live in modern homes built atop modular platforms that rise and fall with the tides. Some communities would be linked to the mainland by bridges and utility lines. Others could exist miles offshore as semi-autonomous cities or even independent nations. Nearly half the world's surface is unclaimed by any nation state. That is true. Our oceans are enormous on Earth. And that is true. Most of it is not claimed by anyone, by any one nation. And many coastal nations can legislate uh, seasteads in their territorial waters, says the Seasteading Institute, which has embraced floating cities with a near-religious fervor. A A few would occupy converted cruise ships flying under independent flags, Others would look like condominium complexes built atop ocean freighters or barges. All will provide offshore refuge from traditional seaside communities where climate hazards are becoming a part of daily life. As an added benefit, floating cities could enjoy a limitless supply of desalinated water while homes and businesses would be powered by microgrids pulsing with wind and solar energy. Think about it. If you're out in the ocean... We know there are lots of, there is lots of wind. We know there is lots of wind out there. So in a situation like that, 
wind energy would probably be a whole lot more practical than it is further inland. You have that constant movement of air. Now we're talking about floating on the sea. We're not talking about the George Jetson situation now. You're much lower. And the Jetsons, the, the, the homes and the businesses were way up in the clouds. We're talking about bringing that down. The floating cities would be floating not in the clouds, but on the water. Transportation would require little more than two feet or, th or two wheels and be entirely carbon-free. In deeper water, floating cities could rely on aquaculture, hydroponics, and rooftop, rooftop gardens. Other essentials could be delivered by barge or ship. So they're putting serious thought into this. Let's face it, we will have to adapt. People on the coastline will have to adapt. Depends on how far that water moves in. Now this is all a tough sell, often punctuated by eye rolls. The thing I usually hear when I first talk about this is, oh, you want to build water world, said landscape architect and seasteading advocate Greg DeLune, referring to the 1995 post-apocalyptic post film starring Kevin Costner as a kind of Mad Max of the sea. You know, that's not really the image we want people to conjure up, but it's often the first thing that comes to their minds, and I get it at Adilum, who recently co-founded the Deep Blue Institute, a Louisiana-based organization dedicated to building marine-based resilient communities. Adilum is convinced that southeast Louisiana, one of the fastest sinking coastlines in the world, could be a U.S. prototype for such a community, where floating structures, homes, businesses, parks, and animal and marinas would often would offer a more stable life than a sinking marsh. When hurricanes and storms threaten, as is increasingly common on the fast-warming Atlantic Ocean and Gulf of Mexico, modular floating cities could be partly disassembled and moved into safe harbor or to calmer waters. The details of how that would happen remain sketchy, but ship-based communities already have the luxury of movement, and back bay communities would garner some protection from the ocean shore. Think about that. Would you like to live on the ocean in a floating city? Reach out to me and tell me if you would or not. I'd like to know what you think about all this. Email me. Info at scienceanimated.net. That's my email address. Info at scienceanimated.net. Futuristic as it sounds, sea studying is not new, and its adaptability to the United States is already being tested through other human-inhabited offshore infrastructure. Oil and gas platforms host hundreds of workers for months at a time. This is true. And as energy companies migrate into deeper water, floating platforms are becoming the norm. For proof, cross the Atlantic Ocean to the Netherlands, a climate-threatened country whose fate is tied to the sea. The Dutch have been doing this for four to five hundred years. Now they're selling their ideas around the world, Dulane said. I see no reason why we can't design and build sustainable, resilient sea-based communities right here borrowing on some of the same marine resilient infrastructure that made the United States a leader in these other offshore activities. Experts say the origins of floating cities also lie in the Netherlands, where Dutch engineers have spent centuries adapting to life at the ocean's doorstep. Much of the western half of the country is below sea level. And Amsterdam, which is a population of 1.1 million, is nearly six feet below the adjoining North Sea. Lesser known but gaining notoriety are the floating homes developed over the last two decades around Amsterdam, one of the lowest lying cities in the world. They include Itchburg, a planned residential district east of Amsterdam where more than 120 floating homes will make up Waterbert West, a floating suburb on an inland bay called the IJ. When fully developed, Eichberg will support 18,000 floating homes for 45,000 people. So they're doing it, folks. But what if the United States, where cities like Boston, New York, Miami, Houston, and New Orleans are equally threatened by storm surges and rising seas? Experts say it's a slow process, in part because much of the coastal adaptation conversation has focused on shoreline protection, home elevations, and coastal retreat. The Dutch have this mentality that we can experiment. The U.S. mentality is we can't change anything. 
said Dale Morse, Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Water Institute of the Gulf, a national nonprofit based in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that, pro that provides research and technical support to communities preparing for sea level rise and other climate change impacts. For eight years after Katrina, Morris worked for the Dutch government as a liaison to Louisiana and other coastal states facing challenges around water management, flood control, and climate adaptation. Morris is an advocate for floating cities in the United States, but he's also a realist. In an interview, he said floating cities are impeded by social, political, economic, and cultural barriers. Among them are the long-standing American ideals of abundant land and natural resources and the notion that people can spread out as cities become denser, dirtier, and more expensive. That hasn't happened. Today, 95 million Americans, nearly 30% of the U.S. population, live in coastline counties. That's according to the Census Bureau, compared with roughly 80 million people in 2000. More and more people are living on the American coastlines. Coastal cities also experience some of the most disruptive and costly climate change impacts, as evidenced by a frequency of tropical storms like Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Harvey, which hit two of the nation's largest urban areas. Other hazards include peak rain events or rain bombs that quickly overwhelm urban infrastructure. And while storm surge flooding from hurricanes is catastrophic and occasional, King tides and sunny day flooding can occur daily and are equally damaging to low-lying cities, experts say. There are visionaries who are investing in these important ideas, and the technology that allows us to do innovative things is improving all the time, Moore said. But the economic components of these ideas have to be addressed. And Morris also noted, it's also true that without inspiration or vision, there is no progress. Now, there's a company in California called Ventive Sea Tech that aims to build permanent ocean communities for the masses using modular structures designed to make ocean living safe, comfortable, and affordable. Its primary product, the float house, is shaped like a capsule with windows. It's described as a finished home ready to move in and is intended to be a year-round home for individuals or a family. Another long-term project, conceived in 2011 by a California firm called Blue Seed, would establish a floating city on a cruise ship parked in international waters about 12 miles offshore from San Francisco. Its, devel its developers describe it as the Googleplex of the sea, where international tech startups could collaborate on projects near Silicon Valley without obtaining visas or to enter the United States. It raised several million dollars in seed money, including from the well-known tech financier, Peter Thiel, but it, has, but it has been mothballed for six years. For U.S.-based seasteaders like Delane, the bridge to a floating city could be years or even decades away, but he's not discouraged. Since arriving in New Orleans, he's been looking for a receptive audience to this idea. He has found a few, including the Tulane University School of Architecture, where a primary research, research effort is focused on implementing ideas that emerged a decade ago through the city's water management planning process called the Dutch Dialogues. I have my pitch deck, and I've been rolling it down here for, almost, for the last few months, Dulane said. The big spin is the dying wetland east of New Orleans, the buffer areas, the barrier islands. People cannot live in these places anymore. Delane says the project could take years to materialize, but as Louisiana undergoes a multi-billion dollar restoration of its coastline, floating communities could be part of the solution. These people don't want a Silicon Valley or NASA project to drop into their backyards, he said, but when your people are leaving and your economy is dying, there's no plan B except to move away. So what do you think about floating cities? And of course, not George Jetson floating cities, but floating cities on the sea. Flooding cities that can go into international waters. Is this where global warming is going to take us? I want to know what you think. Send me a message. Info at scienceanimated.net. Info at scienceanimated.net. And be sure to check out scienceanimated.net for Science Animated the Human Body, which is a 40-minute DVD. It's a 40-minute film on the human body for kids and adults like it too. 
You can purchase the DVD or the stream for only $9.99. That's available on the website now. And of course, there's free content on my YouTube channel. Just you, The easiest way to get there is go to scienceanimated.net. Click on the YouTube icon. It'll take you right to the YouTube channel. I have something called Orbit Show. Orbit Show talks about photosynthesis. Uh, sea lice. There's a permafrost bear episode. So we got some fun stuff there. And also past S-Factors. If you miss any of these S-Factor episodes on Cruising 92.1 WVLT, be sure to check out scienceanimated.net. They're on there as well. And Google Podcast and Apple Podcast. Just type in the yes factor on a search and you'll see me come right up. Please leave a star rating and a review. I'd appreciate that. And I want to thank you for joining me today on the yes factor. You can catch me here the first Saturday of every month at one o'clock on cruise 92.1 WVLT and also online scienceanimated.net and your favorite podcast channels. I want to wish everyone a happy new year. And you have been listening to the S factor. See you next time, everybody. 